What is Zen? Also called Zen Buddhism, it is a sect of Buddhism practiced predominantly in Japan and China. The religion is based on meditation rather than on the strict moral doctrine of Buddhism. It was founded in China in the 5th century AD by Bodhidharma, an Indian Buddhist monk and missionary. He taught that sudden enlightenment can be achieved through the practice of meditation, or wall gazing. The religion defines enlightenment as the direct seeing of one's original nature. What is the Sherman Antitrust Act? Passed by Congress in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was an attempt to break up corporate trusts. Combinations of firms or corporations form to limit competition and monopolize a market. The legislation stated that every contract, combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in the restraint of trade is illegal. While the act made clear that anyone found to be in violation of restraining trade would face fines, jail terms, and the payment of damages. The language lacked clear definitions of what exactly constituted restraint of trade. The nation's courts were left with the responsibility of interpreting the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the justices proved as reluctant to take on big business as Congress had been. The legislation was introduced in Congress by Senator John Sherman, 1823-1900, of Ohio. In response to increasing outcry from state governments and the public for the passage of national antitrust laws, many states had passed their own antitrust bills or had made constitutional provisions prohibiting trusts. But the statutes proved difficult to enforce and big business found ways around them. When the legislation proposed by Sherman reached the Senate, conservative congressmen rewrote it, many charged that the senators had made it deliberately vague. In the decade after its passage, the federal government prosecuted only 18 antitrust cases and court decisions did little to break up monopolies. But after the turn of the century, a progressive spirit in the nation grew. Among progressive reformers' demands was that government regulate business. In 1911, the U.S. Justice Department won key victories against monopolies, breaking up John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company of New Jersey and James B. Duke's American Tobacco. Company. The decision set a precedent for how the Sherman Antitrust Act would be enforced and demonstrated a national intolerance toward monopolistic trade practices. In 1914, national antitrust legislation was strengthened by the passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act, which outlawed price fixing the practice of pricing below cost to eliminate a competitive product made it illegal for the same executives to manage two or more competing companies. A practice called interlocking directorates, and prohibited any corporation from owning stock in a competing corporation. The creation of the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, that same year provided further insurance that U.S. corporations engaging in unfair practices would be investigated by the government. B. 
Between 1880 and the early 1900s corporate trusts proliferated in the United States. Becoming Powerful Business Forces The vague language of the Sherman antitrust legislation and the court's reluctance to prosecute big business based on that act did little to break up the monopolistic giants. The tide turned against corporate trusts when Theodore Roosevelt 1858-1919, became president in September 1901, after President William McKinley, 1843-1901, was assassinated. Roosevelt launched a trust-busting campaign, initiating, through the Attorney General's office. Some 40 lawsuits against American corporations such as American Tobacco Company, Standard Oil Company, and American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T. Government efforts to break up the monopolies were strengthened in 1914, during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. 1856-1924 when Congress passed the Clayton Antitrust Legislation and created the Federal Trade Commission. FTC, which is responsible for keeping business competition free and fair. Trust busting declined during the prosperity of the 1920s, but was again vigorously pursued in the 1930s. During the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882 to 1945 What did Shakespeare study? It is thought that William Shakespeare, 1564 to 1616 attended the King's New School. The local grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, where the main course of instruction was in Latin. There, students were taught rhetoric, logic, and ethics. And studied works by classical authors Terence, Plautus, Cicero, Virgil, Plutarch, Horace, and Ovid. It is believed that this was the extent of Shakespeare's education. There is no evidence that he attended a university. When did Marco Polo travel to the Far East? Marco Polo, 1254-1324, was only in his teens when he left Venice in about 1270 with his father. Niccolo, and his uncle Mafio, traveling an overland route to the east. The Polo brothers had made such a trip once before in 1260 they had traveled as far as Beijing, China. But upon their return home, they learned that Niccolo's wife, Marco Polo's mother, had died. So when the pair of adventurers set out again, they took the young Marco Polo with them. The Polos traveled from Acre, Israel, to Shavaz, Turkey, then through Mosul and Baghdad, in Iraq, to Ormuz. A bustling trade center on the Persian Gulf, where they intended to take a ship for the east. Seeing the ships, the travelers determined they weren't reliable transport, so they opted to continue on land. Heading north to Khorasan, in Iran, through Afghanistan, and to the Pamirs, a high plateau range in Central Asia. It took the Polos 40 days to transverse the high-altitude range. 
finally reaching the garden city of Kashgar, China. From there, the Polos followed a path skirting the Taklamakan Desert and then rested before crossing the Goba Desert. Which they did in 30 days time, covering some 300 miles. Stopping in Tunwang, the center of Buddhism in China, the European travelers then followed a southeast path that would have paralleled the Great Wall, constructed in the 3rd century BC. After following the Yellow, Huanghe, River, the Polos were met by emissaries of Kublai Khan, 1215-1294. They continued with their guides on a 40-day trip to Xanadu, Shangtu, China, 300 miles north of Beijing. Where they were received by Kublai Khan himself, founder and ruler of the Mongol dynasty and grandson of Genghis Khan. C 1162-1227 It was May 1275. Kublai Khan who was an ardent Buddhist and a patron of the arts. Took a liking to the young Marco Polo, who entered into diplomatic service for the ruler. In that capacity Marco Polo traveled to India and visited the kingdom of Kampa. What is now Vietnam, Thailand, the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, Sri Lanka and India. The Polos, European courtiers who were well liked by the Great Khan, stayed in China until 1292, finally returning home by way of Sumatra, India, and Persia, present day Iran. In 1295, they arrived back in Venice, which they found at war with longtime rival Genoa. The Polos carried with them many riches including ivory, jade, jewels, porcelain, and silk. Marco Polo was now a man in his forties and had spent most of his life thus far in the Far East. When did chain stores begin? The innovation of the chain store, technically defined as two or more retail outlets operated by the same company and which sell the same kind of merchandise, was made by American businessman George Gilman, c. 1830-1901, and George Huntington Hartford, 1833-1917. Who in 1859 set up the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company in New York City? Better known as AP, the stores proliferated rapidly, and other chain stores, such as W.P. Woolworth, established 1879, and J.C. Penney, 1902, opened their doors for business. The early 20th century saw tremendous growth of the chain stores. Between 1910 and 1931, the number of A&P stores grew from 200 to more than 15,000. While the department stores, also a byproduct of the late 1800s, catered to middle and upper class customers, the chain stores, including Woolworths Five and Dimes which sold many items at such low price points, served lower income consumers. Chain stores, which operate within all major retailing categories, including grocery stores, department stores, and drug stores, as well as apparel and food outlets, offer consumers many advantages. Their system of centralized and mass buying allow them to acquire merchandise from manufacturers and wholesalers at reduced costs. This savings is passed along to the consumer, 
who pays less for the item. Further, they experience economies of advertising. A single ad placement promotes all the stores within the chain. In the 1920s independent retailers rallied against the chain stores, citing they had unfair advantages. This argument has resurfaced off and on throughout the 20th century. As chain stores entered into more and more retailing sectors, including hardware, jewelry, furniture, music, and books. But the only federal legislation that constructively attempted to regulate the chain stores came in 1936. The Robinson Patman Act tried to control competition. Today chain stores account for roughly one-third of all American retail sales. How old is feminism? Feminists people who believe that women should have economic, political, and social equality with men have existed throughout history. Such women are often described in literature and by history as being women before their time. But as a movement, feminism, which is synonymous with the women's rights movement, did not get underway until the mid-1800s, when women in the United States and Great Britain began organizing and campaigning to win the vote. Early feminists, and feminists today, were likely influenced by the revolutionary work titled A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1792 by British author and educator Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, her daughter was writer Mary Shelley of Frankenstein fame. Wollstonecraft attacked the convention of the day, charging that it kept middle class and upper class women in a state of ignorance, training them to be useless. A staunch promoter of education, she was self-educated. Wollstonecraft is credited with being the first major philosophical feminist. What happened to the Visigoths? When both the Visigoths and Ostrogoths were attacked by the Huns in 370, the Visigoths fared better. Many of them fleeing into a Roman province. In 378 the Visigoths rebelled against the Roman authorities. On horseback, they fought the Battle of Adrianople, in present-day Turkey destroying a Roman army and killing Rome's eastern emperor, Valens, c. 328-378. The Visigoths' introduction of the cavalry. Troops trained to fight on horseback. As part of warfare determined European military, social, and political development for the next thousand years. After the Battle of Adrianople, the Visigoths moved into Italy. And under the leadership of their ruler, Alaric, c. 370-410, sacked Rome in 410, an event that signaled the beginning of the decline of the Roman Empire. After the success of the Visigoths, one tribe after another invaded the empire. The Visigoths continued westward into Gaul. 
and there set up a monarchy that consisted of much of France and Spain and was centered in Toulouse. But in 507 they were driven out by the Franks. And the Visigoths withdrew into the Iberian Peninsula, present-day Spain and Portugal. Toledo was established as the capital of the Visigoth Kingdom in 534. Roderick or Rodrigo, the last of the Visigoth kings in Spain, was defeated and killed in 711 during a battle with the Muslims, Moors, who invaded from northern Africa. The Muslims went on to rule most of the Iberian Peninsula until the mid-1400s. When was leprosy first diagnosed? Leprosy is an ages-old disease, described in many historical texts. Mentioned in the Bible, leprosy was introduced in Europe in the 400s BC. Probably by the troops of the Persian ruler Xerxes, c. 519 to 465 BC, as they moved westward. By the 12th century, leprosy had reached epidemic proportions in Western Europe, even claiming the lives of rulers. Portugal's Alfonso II died from it in 1223, and Robert I, King of Scots, in 1329. Explorers and settlers from the European continent later carried the infectious chronic skin disease to the New World, where it was previously unknown. The cause of leprosy was unknown. While some theorized it was contagious, others asserted that it was hereditary or was caused by eating certain foods. Even potatoes were at one time blamed for originating the affliction. The disease gradually disappeared from Europe, attributable to improved living conditions. Better nutrition, and, later, the advent of drugs that are effective in treatment. The first clinical description was not made until 1874 when Norwegian physician Gerhard Henrik Hansen 1841-1912, discovered the leprosy bacterium. Since then the disease has also been called Hansen's disease. Today, leprosy afflicts about 5 million people worldwide. It is endemic, native, to tropical or subtropical regions, including Africa. Central and South America, India, and Southeast Asia. Most cases of leprosy that occur in the United States are among immigrants from areas where the disease is endemic. Beginning in the mid 1950s, the Roman Catholic nun Mother Teresa. 1910 to 1997 of Calcutta ministered to those afflicted with leprosy, setting up colonies for their care. Separation of church and state affected the public schools? Religion in American public schools continued to be a hot topic throughout the 1900s. But the Supreme Court rulings in the middle of the 20th century proved to have the most bearing on religious practices in state-supported schools. On June 17, 1963, in an 8-to-1 ruling, 
the Supreme Court decided that prayer and Bible reading in U.S. public schools were unconstitutional. The decision, in the case of Skemp v. Abington Township, culminated a series of high court rulings over the course of almost 20 years, which gradually removed the practice of religious activities from public schools. The rulings began in 1947 with the New Jersey case of Everson v. Board of Education, in which the court, in a 5 to 4 vote, defended the use of state funds to transport children to parochial schools, but warned that a wall of separation between church and state must be maintained. In 1948, in McCollum v. Board of Education, the court banned a program of religious instruction from the schools of Champaign, Illinois. In Engel v. Vital, 1962, the justices of the Supreme Court ruled that the state-composed prayer recited in New York classrooms was unconstitutional. When was money introduced? The use of money dates back some 4,000 years, when people began using something of recognized value. Such as precious metals including gold and silver, to purchase goods and services. In the absence of money, all transactions were made on the barter system. Which is an exchange of goods and services negotiated by the parties involved. The introduction of money simplified the acquisition of products and services. The ancient country of Lydia, in the western part of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, is credited with the first use of standardized coins, made of gold and silver, in the 7th century BC. How did the Treaty of Versailles pave the way for World War II? In the aftermath of World War I, 1914-18, Germany was severely punished. One clause in the Treaty of Versailles even stipulated that Germany take responsibility for causing the war. In addition to its territorial losses, Germany was also made to pay for an allied military force that would occupy the west bank of the Rhine River, intended to keep Germany in check for the next 15 years. The treaty also limited the size of Germany's military. In 1921 Germany received a bill for reparations, it owed the Allies $33 million. While the post-war German government had been made to sign the Treaty of Versailles under the threat of more fighting from the Allies, the German people nevertheless faulted their leaders for accepting such strident terms. Not only was the German government weakened, but public resentment over the Treaty of Versailles soon developed into a strong nationalist movement led by German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945. What were Galileo's contributions to science and mathematics? Galileo Galilei, 1564-1642, is credited with establishing the modern method of experimentation. 
he was the first scientist and thinker to try to prove or disprove theory by conducting tests and observing the results. Prior to Galileo, scientific theory was purely based on hypothesis and conjecture. It was in the interest of conducting accurate tests and in making precise observations that Galileo developed a number of inventions, including the hydrostatic balance. A device designed to measure the density of objects, in about 1586, and the thermometer. One of the first measuring devices used in science, in 1593. The invention most widely credited to Galileo is the telescope. However, he did not originate the instrument, but rather improved it, in 1609. He was also the first to use a telescope to study the skies, which led him to make a series of discoveries. All in 1610, the moon shines with reflected light, the surface of the moon is mountainous. The Milky Way is made up of countless stars, and Jupiter has four large satellites. He was even able to correctly estimate the period of rotation of each of these moons, which he named Medicean stars, for his benefactor, Cosimo de' Medici. Galileo was also the first to observe the phases of Venus, which are similar to the moons, and to discover sunspots. Prior to these astronomical discoveries, Galileo had already made significant contributions to science. In 1589, when he was only 25 years old, he published a treatise on the center of gravity in solids. From 1602 to 1609 he studied the motion of pendulums and other objects along arcs and inclines. From these observations, he concluded that falling objects accelerate at a constant rate. This law of uniform acceleration later helped Sir Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727, derive the law of gravity. Galileo also demonstrated that the path of a projectile is a parabola. Galileo was a professor of mathematics at Pisa, 1589-1591, and at Padua, 1592-1610, Italy. In 1610 he was appointed philosopher and mathematician. Extraordinary to the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosimo de' Medici. When did football begin? In ancient Greece and Rome, a game was played in which the object was to Move a ball across a goal line by throwing, kicking, or running with it. Several modern games were derived from this, including rugby and soccer. From which American football directly evolved, in much of the world football refers to soccer. In which players are allowed to advance the ball only with their feet or heads. Historians generally agree that the first game of American football was played on November 6, 1869, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, when Rutgers defeated the College of New Jersey, present-day Princeton University. 6-4. They played on a field 120 yards long and 75 yards wide and used a round, soccer-like ball. Other Eastern colleges, including Columbia, Harvard, and Yale, soon added the sport to their athletic programs. 
In 1876 a set of official rules were compiled. In the 1880s Yale coach Walter Camp, 1859-1925, revised the rules, giving the world the game played today. He limited teams to 11 players, established the scrimmage system for putting the ball into play. Introduced the concept of requiring a team to advance the ball a certain number of yards within a given number of downs. And came up with the idea of marking the field with yard lines. Who were the conquistadors? Conquistador is the Spanish word for conqueror. The Spaniards who arrived in North and South America in the late 1400s and early 1500s were just that conquerors of the American Indians and their lands. In many cases, the Spaniards were the first Europeans to arrive in these lands. Where they encountered native inhabitants including the Aztec of Mexico. The Maya of southern Mexico and Central America, and the Inca of western South America. By the mid-1500s these native peoples had been conquered. Their populations decimated by the Spanish conquistadors. The conquest happened in two ways first, the Spaniards rode on horseback and carried guns. While their native opponents were on foot and carried crude weapons such as spears and knives. And second, the European adventurers brought illnesses, such as smallpox and measles to which the native populations of the Americas had no immunities, causing the people to become sick and die. By 1535 conquistadors such as Francisco Pizarro, c. 1475 to 1541, Hernán Cortés, 1485 to 1547, and Vasco Núñez de Balboa, 1475 to 1519, had claimed the southwestern United States. Mexico, Central America, and much of the West Indies, islands of the Caribbean, for Spain. What alliances were forged during World War I? In its declaration of war against Serbia in late July 1914, Austria-Hungary was joined in early August by its ally Germany, which together formed the Central Powers. In October 1914 Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire joined the Central Powers. When the fighting began, France, Britain and Russia threw their support behind Serbia, and together were known as the Allies. The Allies declared war on the Ottoman Empire in November 1914. After Turkish ships bombarded Russian ports on the Black Sea and Turkish troops invaded Russia. Eventually, 20 more nations joined the Allies, but not all of them sent troops to the front. Belgium, Montenegro, and Japan joined the Allies in August 1914. With Japan declaring war on Germany and invading several Pacific islands to drive out the Germans. In 1915 Italy and San Marino joined, as fighting war on, in 1916, Romania and Portugal became Allied nations and 1917 saw the entry of eight countries. 
most notably the United States and China, but also Liberia, Greece, Siam, Panama, Cuba, and Brazil. Before the war ended in 1918, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua all became supporters of the Allies. When were schools in the United States desegregated? On May 17, 1954, in the case of Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled, 9-0, that racial segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. The court overturned the separate but equal doctrine laid down in the 1896 case. Plessy v. Ferguson. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974. Ordered the states to proceed with all deliberate speed to integrate educational facilities. Also in 1954, on November 7, the Supreme Court ordered desegregation of public golf courses. Parks, swimming pools, and playgrounds. In the aftermath of these rulings, desegregation proceeded slowly and painfully. In the early 1960s sit-ins, freedom rides, and similar expressions of nonviolent resistance by blacks and their sympathizers led to a decrease in segregation practices in public facilities. How has the U.S. Who were the great thinkers of scholasticism? Just as Islamic philosophers reinterpreted faith by applying reason, subordinating revelation to reason, Western philosophers endeavored to incorporate the doctrines of Greek philosophy into the theology of the Christian Church. Leaders in this movement included St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, St. Anselm, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Augustine of Hippo, 354-430. Lived during a time when the last vestiges of the pagan world of the Romans was giving way to Christianity. His theological works, including sermons, books, and pastoral letters, reveal a Platonic influence, foreshadowing the movement of scholasticism that emerged more than six centuries later, during the 11th century. Augustine believed that understanding can lead one to faith and that faith can lead a person to understanding. He also argued that Christians can understand the nature of the Trinity by examining their own nature, through introspection. One of Scholasticism's founders, Anselm, c. 1033-1109, was a Benedictine monk who in 1093 became Archbishop of Canterbury. He became famous for writing about the attributes of God, in his work Monologian. And for trying to prove the existence of God, in Proslogian, by rational means alone. Arguing that God is that of which nothing greater can be thought, that of which nothing greater can be thought must include existence. If it did not, then something greater could be thought, and therefore God necessarily exists. 
but the greatest figure of scholasticism was St. Thomas Aquinas, 1225-1274, who is also one of the principal saints of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1879 his philosophical works were declared the official Catholic doctrine by Pope Leo XIII, 1810-1903. While he was teaching at universities in Cologne, Germany, and Paris between 1248 and 1272, Thomas Aquinas penned his major works. Summa Contra Gentiles, 1259-64, and Summa Theologica, 1266-73. He discarded the Platonic leanings of St. Augustine, to whom truth was a matter of faith, interpreting Aristotle's naturalistic philosophy. Similar to the Islamic philosopher Ibn Nasr, c. 878 to 950, who argued that religion and philosophy are not in conflict with each other. Thomas Aquinas believed faith and reason are in harmony with each other. His work is considered the greatest achievement of medieval philosophy. Making the 13th century scholasticism's golden age. Thomas Aquinas was canonized in 1323 and was proclaimed a doctor of the Catholic Church in 1567. What was the importance of Martin Luther's 95 Theses? The Reformation as a movement began on October 31, 1517, when the German monk and theology professor Martin Luther 1483-1546, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church at Wittenberg, Saxony, Germany. The theses, which are arguments or assertions, question the value of indulgences. The pardons that were disseminated by the church, and condemned the sale of them. Luther had already begun to preach the doctrine of salvation by faith rather than by works. And during 1518 he went on to publicly defend his beliefs, which were in direct opposition to the church. The following year he expanded his argument against the Church by denying the supremacy of the Pope. In 1521 Pope Leo X, 1475-1521, declared Luther a heretic and excommunicated him. Ordered to appear before the Diet of Worms in April 1521, Luther refused to retract his statements of his beliefs. saying unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. The following month, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, 1500-1558, issued the Edict of Worms, declaring Luther to be an outlaw and authorizing his death. But the Prince of Saxony, known by history as Frederick the Wise, 1463-1525, saw fit to protect Luther, whom he had appointed as a faculty member at the University of Wittenberg. Founded by Frederick the Wise in 1502. There Luther translated the New Testament into German and undertook a translation of the entire Bible. Luther continued the Protestant movement until his death in 1546.
who was John Peter Zenger. John Peter Zenger, 1697-1746, was a New York City printer who was accused of seditious libel in 1735. His case changed the definition of libel in American courtrooms and laid the foundation for freedom of the press. The German-born Zenger immigrated to the American colonies in 1710, when he was 13 years old. He found a job as a printer's apprentice, working on the colony's official newspaper, the New York Gazette. Fifteen years later he began his own operation, which was mostly concerned with printing religious pamphlets. In 1733 New York received a new colonial governor from England. William Cosby quickly earned the contempt of the colonists, both rich and poor. Prosperous businessmen who opposed Cosby and his grievous tactics approached Zenger, offering to back a newspaper that he would both edit and publish. Zenger agreed and on November 5, 1733, the first issue of the weekly journal was released. It included scathing criticisms of the royal governor, raising Cosby's ire. After burning several issues of the papers, Cosby had Zenger arrested in November 1734. The editor-publisher continued to operate the journal from inside his jail cell, dictating editorials to his wife through the door. Zenger's case went to trial in August 1735. Prominent Philadelphia attorney Andrew Hamilton 1676-1741, considered the best lawyer in the colonies, came to Zenger's defense. Hamilton admitted his client was guilty of publishing the papers, but, he argued, that in order for libel to be proved, Zenger's statements had to be both false and malicious. The prosecution contested the definition of libel, asserting that libelous statements are any words that are scandalous, seditious, and tend to disquiet the people. The court agreed with the prosecution, and Hamilton was therefore unable to bring forth any evidence to support the truth of the materials and are printed in the weekly journal. The defense argument was not heard until the closing statement was made by Hamilton. His summation stands as one of the most famous in legal history. He accused the court of suppressing evidence, urging the jury to consider the court's actions as the strongest evidence and went on to declare that liberty is the people's only bulwark against lawless power. Men who injure and oppress the people under their administration provoke them to cry out and complain. The brilliant attorney closed by urging the gentlemen of the jury to take up the cause of liberty. Telling them that by so doing, they will have baffled the attempt of tyranny. The seven jury members were convinced by Hamilton's impassioned speech and found Zenger not guilty. Discharged from prison the next day, Zenger returned to his printing business. Publishing the transcripts of his own trial. While colonial officials were reluctant to accept the case's ruling on the definition of libel. The case became famous throughout the American colonies. And once the colonists had thrown off England's royal rule and established a new republic, the nation's founding fathers codified the Zenger trial's ruling in the Bill of Rights.
the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees freedom of press. How old is guerrilla warfare? Guerrilla warfare dates back to ancient times but got its name during the Peninsular War of 1809 to 1814 when Napoleon Bonaparte 1769 to 1821 fought for control of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. In Spanish, guerrilla means small war. The resistance to Napoleon's troops employed tactics that are typical of what we know. As guerrilla warfare fighting in small bands, ambushes, sudden raids, and sabotage, it is Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong, 1893-1976, who, in his 22-year fight against the Chinese nationalists, from 1927 to 1949, is believed to have developed the techniques of modern guerrilla warfare. Chairman Mao slowly but surely gained the support and sympathy of the common people in particular those living in rural areas. Eventually, he had control of the masses who believed the reforms he would make once in office would be favorable to them. The people would provide the manpower and supplies that would sustain the fight. If any followers faulted in their loyalty to the cause, they would be punished. Today, guerrillas rely on terrorist attacks against governments, goading the military into action. Which, in turn, rallies the public in its outrage against government. In this way, guerrilla movements can gain popular support over time. Such movements are by no means limited to the countryside. Urban attacks include tactics such as kidnapping and assassination. Such guerrilla measures have led to the outbreak of civil wars. What is the Patriot Act? The Patriot Act is a controversial law passed by a wide majority of Congress and signed by President George W. Bush, 1946, in October 2001. It was designed to strengthen national security following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The legislation relaxes federal surveillance laws, granting authorities broad leeway to gather information on U.S. citizens and resident foreigners. It also expands the government's prosecutorial powers against suspected terrorists and their associates. The Complex Act, which contains 168 sections, allows the nation's intelligence and law enforcement agencies to among other things monitor email and financial transactions without securing a subpoena use wiretapping without a court order and require internet service providers ISPs to hand over usage data on customers one of the most controversial sections of the Patriot Act is the so-called library provision, which allows government officials to secretly subpoena books, records, papers, documents and other items from businesses, hospitals, 
and other organizations. Critics feared that the government could use the provision to snoop into the reading habits of innocent Americans. The reaction to the provision was so strong that, according to the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, five states and 375 communities in 43 states had passed Anti-Patriot Act. Resolutions by Spring 2005 Another contentious section of the Patriot Act allows the delayed notification of search warrants. This is called the sneak and peek provision because it lets Federal officials search a suspect's home without telling the individual until later. While many legislators and security experts hailed the Patriot Act provisions as necessary in combating terrorism and securing the homeland, others immediately saw the legislation as a serious infringement of civil rights. Supporters pointed to the hundreds of charges brought against suspected terrorists, as well as hundreds of convictions, as a result of the Patriot Act. But critics, including legislators, the ACLU, conservative groups, and many citizens, called the act unconstitutional and unpatriotic. A top ACLU representative said, cooler heads can now see that the Patriot Act went too far, too fast and that it must be brought back in line with the Constitution. The fallout included charges of abuses by law enforcement. The introduction of alternate legislation in Congress to revise or repeal sections of the Act, as well as challenges in court. In 2004 at least two sections were found to be unconstitutional in district court. As the debate continued over the constitutionality of the Patriot Act, some provisions were set to expire the end of 2005. In April two of the Bush administration's top law enforcement officials urged Congress to renew every provision of the Anti-Terror Act, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. 1955, said that some of the most controversial provisions of the Patriot Act had proven invaluable in fighting terrorism. FBI Director Robert Mueller, 1944 said sections of the law that allow intelligence and law enforcement agencies to share information were especially important. When did the Sunni and Shia sects of Islam form? It was during the 600s, not long after Muhammad's death. When Muslims split into two main divisions, Sunni and Shia. Sunnite Muslims, who account for most of the Islamic world today, believe that Islamic leadership passes to caliphs. Temporal and spiritual leaders, who are selected from the Prophet Muhammad's tribe. The Shiites believe, however, that the true leaders of Islam descend from Ali, c. 600-661, Muhammad's cousin and the husband of Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. Called the Shining One, c. 616-633. Ali, who was the fourth caliph, 656-61. Is revered by Shiites as the rightful successor to the Prophet Muhammad and are led by his descendants. Shiites form the largest subgroup, but there are other sects within Islam as well. 
the Wahhabi Muslims are a puritanical sect, the Baha'is emerged from the Shiites. And the Ismaili Koja Muslims have been in existence almost from the beginning of Islam. While Islamic practices may vary somewhat among the sects. All Islamic people uphold the five pillars of faith. Is the bombing of buildings a new phenomenon? Though terrorist bombings seem a plague of recent decades. The history of such strikes goes back to a time before the word terrorism was part of everyday language. In 1920 a bomb explosion on September 16 ripped through the J.P. Morgan Bank building in New York City. Killing 39 people, 30 of them instantly, injuring 300 more, and causing $2 million in property damage. According to eyewitness accounts, the bomb had been carried by a horse-drawn carriage into the heart of America's financial center just before midday, and it exploded as nearby church bells tolled noon. Among the victims were passers-by in the street and people working at their desks, including some high-ranking personnel at J.P. Morgan. Suspicion centered around anarchists, some of whom were questioned by the police and Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. But no culprit was ever found. Until September 11, 2001, that event was the deadliest bombing in New York City history. Further, the many bombings carried out by white supremacists during the civil rights movement in the 1960s are also testimony to the fact that targeted bombings are not a new phenomenon. Between 1962 and 1965, as the Council of Federated Organizations worked to register voters in Mississippi, racial extremists turned to violence. Among the tactics used in addition to shootings, beatings, and lynches were bombings. During Freedom Summer, 1964, alone, more than 65 homes, churches, and other buildings were bombed in Mississippi. Perhaps the most widely publicized of those bombings was the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, on September 15. 1963 200 people were attending Sunday services when a bomb exploded. Four young African American girls were killed. But the sorrow of that day did not stop there. The bombing provoked racial riots, and police used dogs to control the crowds. Two black schoolboys were killed in the melee. Who was the first person to reach the North Pole? There has been some dispute over this one. The credit usually goes to American explorer and former naval officer Robert E. Peary, 1856-1920, who after several tries, reached the North Pole by dog sled on April 6, 1909, along with Matthew A. Henson and three Inuit companions. Unbeknownst to him, five days before this achievement, another American explorer, Dr. Frederick Cook, 1865 to 1940 claimed that he had reached the North Pole a year earlier. 
Perry and Cook knew each other. Cook had been the surgeon on the Perry Arctic Expedition of 1891 to 1892, which reached Greenland. And for his part, Cook's claim was investigated by scientists. But the evidence he supplied did not substantiate the claim. Thus, Peary was recognized as the first to reach the northern extremity of Earth's axis. What was the Enola Gay? It was the American B-29 bomber that dropped the first atomic bomb ever used in warfare. On August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay flew over Hiroshima, Japan, to drop an bomb over the city. The explosion killed an estimated 80,000 people and leveled an area of about 5 square miles in Hiroshima. An important manufacturing and military center. Thousands more died later from radiation exposure. Who were the Wobblies? The Wobblies were the early radical members of the industrial workers of the world. IWW, a union founded in 1905 by the leaders of 43 labor organizations. The group pursued short-term goals via strikes and acts of sabotage as well as the long-term goal of overthrowing capitalism and rebuilding society based on socialist principles. One IWW organizer proclaimed that the final aim is revolution. Their extremist views and tactics attracted national attention. Making IWW and Wobblies household terms during the early decades of the 20th century. Founded and led by miner and socialist William Big Bill Haywood. 1869 to 1928 and mine workers agitator Mary Mother Jones 1830 to 1930 the IWW aimed to unite all workers in a camp mine or factory for the eventual takeover of the industrial facility the union organized strikes in lumber and mining camps in the west in the steel mills of Pennsylvania, and in the textile mills of New England. The leadership advocated the use of violence to achieve its revolutionary goals and opposed mediation. Negotiations moderated by a neutral third party, collective bargaining. Bargaining between worker representatives and an employer, and arbitration, third party mediation. The group declined during World War I, 1914-18. When the IWW led strikes that were suppressed by the federal government. The organization's leaders were arrested and the organization weakened. Haywood was convicted of sedition, inciting resistance to lawful authority. But managed to escape the country. He died in the Soviet Union, where he was given a hero's burial for his socialist views. The IWW never rose again to the prominent status of its early, controversial days. Many accounts of the group's history cite its demise in the 1920s. But, according to its own statement. 
the organization continued to enjoy a more or less continuous existence into the 21st century. As the IWW prepared to celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2005, it continued to promote its original goal of organizing workers by industry rather than trade. Under the IWW scheme, workers around the world would organize into one big union divided into six camps. Or departments agriculture and fisheries, mining and minerals, general construction. Manufacture and general production, transportation and communication, and public service. In the early 2000s the IWW had a few dozen member unions in the United States. As well as branches in Australia, Japan, Canada and the British Isles. Who were the most important rulers of the Roman Empire? The 500 Years of the Roman Empire, 27b. C to AD 476, gave history some of its most noteworthy and most diabolical leaders. The major emperors are names that are familiar to most every student of Western civilization. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Trajan. Marcus Aurelius, Diocletian, and Constantine I, called the Great. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero were the first five emperors. A succession covering 75 years of Roman rule. Octavian, 63b.ca.d14, later known as Augustus. Became Roman emperor when, after the assassination of his great uncle, Julius Caesar. A power struggle ensued and he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra to take the throne. Under Augustus's rule. From 27 BC to AD 14 began the 200 years of the Pax Romana, a period of relative peace. During this time no power emerged that was strong enough to sustain conflict with the Roman army. Consequently, Rome was able to turn its attention to the arts, literature, education, and trade. As second emperor of Rome, Tiberius, 42b.ca.d37, came under the influence of Roman politician and conspirator Sejanus. D.A.D. 31. Tiberius was the adopted son of Emperor Augustus. And though he had been carefully schooled and groomed to take on the leadership role. Ultimately he became a tyrannical ruler, the final years of his reign were marked by viciousness and cruelty. Upon Tiberius's death, his nephew Caligula, A.D. 12-41, ascended the throne. Born Gaius Caesar. He was nicknamed Caligula, meaning little boots. Since he was brought up in military camps and at an early age had been dressed as a soldier. For a short time Caligula ruled with moderation. But not long after he came to power. He fell ill and thereafter exhibited the erratic behavior for which he is well known. Most scholars agree that Caligula must have been crazy. He was murdered in AD 41, and Claudius. Also nephew to Tiberius, was then proclaimed emperor. Claudius. 10b.ca.d54, renewed the expansion of Rome, waging battle with Germany, Syria. 
and Mauritania, present-day Algeria and Morocco, and conquering half of Britain. Though his administration was reportedly well run, he had his enemies, among them was his niece. Agrippina the Younger, AD 1559, who is believed to have murdered him in 54, after securing her son. Nero, as successor to the throne. In Nero, AD 37-68, the early Roman Empire had perhaps its most despotic ruler. Though his early years in power were marked by the efficient conduct of public affairs. In 59 he had his mother assassinated, she reportedly had tried to rule through her son. And Nero's legacy from that point forward is one of ruthless behavior. He was involved in murder plots, ordered the deaths of many Romans. Instituted the persecution of Christians, and led an extravagant lifestyle that emptied the public coffers. He was declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and in the year 68 took his own life. With the exception of Augustus, the first century AD of the Roman Empire was marked by Extreme rulers The second century AD was marked by the leadership of soldiers and statesmen. Trajan, 53-117 who ruled from the year 98 until his death 19 years later. Is best known for his military campaigns, which expanded Rome's territory. He was also a builder constructing bridges, roads, and many buildings. When Marcus Aurelius, 121-80, ascended to emperor in 161. He had already been in public office for more than 20 years. A man of great experience, he was reportedly both learned and of gentle character. His generals put down revolting tribes, and, in addition to winning victories along the Danube River, his troops also fought barbarians in the north. 